So um, when I decided to make that film, like one of the biggest reasons why I decided to move to directing was because I felt as an actor I was uh, kind of sort of forced to be passive all the time. That's the nature of an actor's job. You're kind of passive all the time. You're relying on your agent or your manager. So you're re you're relying on your agent to get your auditions and all that. And I didn't like. I mean, like personally, I didn't like to be passive too much. So I decided that I want. I wanted to, to make a film because people around me were making films in, on a low budget and having success in uh, film festivals. So to be honest, at the time I didn't know what I was thinking and uh, I, started to, I started to write my script not knowing really how to write a script and uh, it took me a year to write a subpar script so I did that and I held castings and I held auditions and all that. People came to audition for roles. I had somebody play the role of Tuck until one day before we shot, I finally decided that it wasn't working. Like, um, <laughs> and I couldn't get like uh, I mean like I, it was a low budget film obviously so I couldn't get somebody who was uh, experienced enough I guess um, to play a main role I always think like for main roles experience is more important than talent unless that, unless that talented person is a star then he or she adds a lot of value to the film otherwise I would always pick an experienced actor over a talented actor for a main role in a feature film because you need range so my guy wasn't really working out, and one day before we shot, I told the AD and I told the assistant director and the, the cameraman, the, the, the DP, that I was gonna put myself in it. And everybody, it threw everybody off for a couple of days, but I mean, in the end, I think it, it turned out to be a, good, a better decision because um, I think we'd have a better film. I guess I offended the actor, so I've, I've always felt like very apologetic, but um, as the director of the film or the creator of the film, I always say that I would do anything like to, for, for the best interest of the film. It's not for me, it's for the film. And when the film succeeds, everyone succeeds. Decisions have to be made, so it was a bit exciting. I was coming off of uh, acting in a TV series in China too, so I felt kind of sharp as an actor as well, and I wrote the script so I knew the character, so I decided to put myself in. This whole story actually came about when I heard a rumor at that time, which was an interesting rumor that I heard, that there was some village in China where the village head sort of um, consolidated money from every villager in that village and sent a representative to, to Macau to gamble with that money hoping to change the fortunes of that village. So that was just rumor. M maybe it's true, maybe it's not, but that fascinated me. So yeah. you, you wrote a story based on what you heard before? It, it started from there, but then obviously that, that, that film wasn't about that, but then so things evolved from there. Okay. And also from what I knew about Macau. So the two Macau characters, Amanda and her brother, they were from Macau. So they were really from Macau, they were not professional actors. The girl, Amanda, she was at that time graduating from university and she came for audition and she did a good audition and she was asking me and she said she's planning to join the Miss Macau beauty pageant and asked me what I thought about it. And I said, well, I mean, like, if you get into the pageant or you get in as a finalist or something, if, and if I choose you as the role, you would add value to my film. So I'm always looking at it from the film's point of view. <laughs> and she did get into the finals. So she was a finalist of that, and I kept my promise, and I put her in the film. And she, I think she did a pretty good job as a first-time actor. And then the brother, he had appeared in a couple of other Macau films, and I saw him in those films, and I approached the director to, to, to contact him. And I think he, he had a very strong presence on screen and people remember him. The other actors, the two mainland actors, the uncle and Winnie, like they're from Hong Kong. A lot of audience in Macau has asked me like, uh, why do you always talk about gambling? Or why do you choose to talk about casinos? Because I think they get a little defensive when they, when they see films portraying their city as a gambling city because they, they of course, obviously it's more than that to them and they don't want the world to see them as only that. Uh, but then first of all, Ruler City is not about gambling, right? And then secondly, I feel like um, we need something for international audience, in my opinion, to have, like, the, to, to relate to, to draw them in before they would actually look at the real story. Towards me, they were very welcome. You know, they're they are generally, Macau people are generally very genuine people and very simple people in a nice way and very friendly, you know, very hospitable and they welcome people. Uh, especially back then, I had, but these days Macau has become really dense and also really expensive to be honest. And I think that 
takes away some of the compassion that the people used to show more because with higher costs of living, people struggle more to, to make money and therefore they have less time, they are more tired and therefore less compassion. If you have been to Macau, like the, the residents, the very common down to earth residents, they are living just next door to a huge casino. So there's so many casinos there that you can almost like not, there's no way you can like kind of escape the presence of the casinos. And also these days, this time around, I was just in Macau a couple of months ago, and this time around, like something that really happened was that the prices of those of food in those local eating places, which we call like Ta San Teng, so those local eating places, the prices of food there has risen so much that by paying a little bit more, you can actually go to a restaurant in the casino with better service, maybe better food, better environment for sure. So a lot of the local people are actually having their regular meals in casino restaurants because they just have to pay a little bit more, which is quite expensive actually. But then the local eating places are no longer cheap and the food quality in the local eating places cannot compare with the casino. So more and more like life I feel is like drifting into the casinos or around the casinos. And in, in the US it is a lot it takes a lot more money essentially to to do to make a film. I always see it this way that in most countries that we go to there's always an invisible quota or an official quota as like 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 China has for domestic films. And then there's Hollywood films, obviously. Every country shows Hollywood films. Like in Singapore, it is up to the market to decide. So there's no official quota for domestic films, but there is a demand. Therefore, there are domestic films. So in America, the domestic films are the Hollywood films, right? So uh, if you have, I mean, the Hollywood blockbusters, they are like 100 million or more. Um, I think like a two, three million dollar film or even a ten million dollar film may not be able to compete at that level. But then like a three million dollar film, which is the norm in many parts of Asia, would be able to compete with the Hollywood blockbusters in that country. Because they have their local stars, they have their local following, they are talking about something very local which people there can relate to. So that gives them a fighting chance to, to, to compete with Hollywood blockbusters in their territory. I struggled for a long time to get Roulette City to go into the cinemas, and as a filmmaker, your goal is to have a commercial release for your film. That's, to me, that's the, that's the main goal when you make a feature film. And when it first released in Japan, in a cinema in Tokyo, I was there for the premiere, and I went to the bathroom, and I heard an announcement that says that audience for Batman, Spider-Man, and Roulette City Please uh, enter your respective theaters right now. And that was like, maybe like my proudest moment in the bathroom, <laughs> listening to this, you know, like in the same sentence as Batman and Spider-Man. Of course, it's not the same kind of film, but then it marks like the, 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 the premiere of the film. My second film, which is the one that I just talked about, is shot on the iPhone. Yeah. So the iPhone 7? 6S and 7. Oh, 6S. So last year we shot in Macau. We began shooting in Macau last year and it was on the 6S. And this July, just a couple of months ago, I shot a couple more scenes in LA here, and it was on the 7. Well, everyone had an iPhone, but we didn't just shoot on the iPhone. So we had like uh, apps, and we had lenses and stabilizers. There's a lot of other things we attached to the phone to make it look better. And in Macau, we were sponsored by the Apple people there, so that helped.